Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their yarn, knitting and comedy in equally large measures. I'm your host, Jo Milmine, and today's show brings you Claire Devine, who's going to talk to us about how to choose yarn for socks. I have a preview of a new yarn from Black of Four Ying and a rundown of the latest offering from the Golden Skein. Hello and welcome into another episode of the Shiny Bees podcast. Today is Sunday the 9th of November. How are you all doing? I hope you're all well since last time I spoke to you. I know a lot of you had a very, very fun Halloween. Helped in no way at all by my hilarious pattern picks. Thanks ever so much to uh, Frickstri- Frickstrick, I can't say it, my dear, and she's terrible, I apologise, uh, for sending me a wonderful link to an entire book of toilet roll cozies, which is available on Amazon, no less, for £9.99. I think I might be treating myself to one of those for Christmas. And I'm glad you all enjoyed the hilarity that ensued from that. We didn't get very many trick-or-treaters, disappointingly, or geysers. I think because we live at the very top of the hill, at the very back of the estate, and because I hadn't been doing any competitive pumpkin carving, I only had a very sad little tea light out the front that the beast had uh, painted last year at nursery uh, to advertise the fact we were open for business, so to speak. So now I've got an entire bucket of uh, swizzle stuff um for those who are not familiar it's retro sweeties they've been going since when i was a kid i remember getting these bags of swizzle sweeties and swizzles make the uh, drumstick lollies and blackjacks though disappointingly there are no blackjacks in this bucket as well as the little um these little tiny kind of round balls that come in a long thin uh, bag. They make Parma violets. They make uh, swizzle lollies. Funnily enough, and the ones that come that have got a wrapper on them that look like a fruit, but are in no way containing any fruit whatsoever. Just a large amount of sugar and flavouring. They're the ones. So I have an enormous bucket of these left now. And after testing out what would happen in a very scientific manner when we gave uh, some sweeties to the children, I have decided to donate all of these to the children that are going to be in the chorus in the pantomime, in which I am the cat, Dick Whittington's cat, Tommy. I have managed to source a costume now, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, getting it all over and done with, (laughs) to be honest with you. Um, I'm sure it'll be fine when I have an audience to play up to, because I am a little bit of an entertainer, and I do like to mess about a little bit, and... um, at the moment we're at that kind of tricky stage where we know all the jokes and it's not hilariously funny every time we hear them again for the 15th time that week so uh, tickets are on sale so if you find yourself in Elgin in the middle of December and would like to come and see my pantomime uh, with me in it playing a rather comedy cat then please do feel free I know a few people have been uh, wondering about whether there will be a pantomime episode from Hoxton this year on the Electric Sheep podcast Now she has been a little bit quiet recently, but this week it came to light exactly why she had been a little bit quiet and it would appear she has a little hoxette, little baby that's just arrived and so that's where she's been. Now I'm not really sure if she will do the the pantomime this year, but she has done several episodes in the past and I'll link to those in the show notes if you want a bit of a pantomime giggle. But if she decides not to, then maybe I'll treat you, maybe I'll write one a comedy version of Dick Whittington for you. I thought she'd already done a Dick Whittington one and I was going to direct you to that. However, if she has, I can't find it in the back episodes. There is Aladdin and Cinderella and there's one that the sheep wrote and there was another one at the beginning, but I don't think it's Dick Whittington. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but if not, then uh, then maybe I'll treat you and, and you'll get a, a somewhat kind of cheaper version of the Hoxton pantomime because we, we just simply can't have you missing out. As you probably just heard, I am joined by my trusty third in command podcast host, the Wombolator. He's lying on the floor just by the side of me. So you may hear the occasional groan when he thinks I've banged on enough and uh, he sends his little woofy greetings to you all. Uh, Bowser isn't in here. I think he's probably guarding the door because I've uh, once again shipped off the uh, uh, the mill miners with uh, Millie 
to uh, go and have some fun whilst I record a show. So I've got quite a lot of stuff to talk to you about today and we will be starting our new segment uh, where we are all going to learn to knit socks. 2015 is going to be the year of socks. Having moved somewhere much, much colder than South Africa and indeed Lincolnshire and other inland areas in which I've lived since I got back to the UK, I am getting full use out of uh, my knitted goods so far and I do need to produce some more knitted socks because my feet get incredibly cold. I must have some kind of circulation problem. Uh, and I do get really, really cold feet. So the only way to get around that is to wear hand-knitted socks and I don't have enough pairs of them. So as I mentioned last time, we are going to do a year of socks palooza and by the end of the year, I will have 12 pairs at least of knitted socks is the plan. So that will be coming up shortly. But before we uh, crash straight into that, I'll give you a bit of information about the latest golden skein. It's been quite a while since I've given you any golden skein news and therefore I'm not really helping you and enabling you on your way to getting some awesome yarns. The uh, club that I've not told you about but I'm going to know, never fear, is the Autumn Club from The Power of Three and what we do for this is we send out a photo to the same photo to three different hand dyers that we've selected and we will usually pick three different bases, although we didn't this time for a good reason. And they're allowed to dye however they like to that inspiration picture, using that as an inspiration for colour um, to produce yarns that are, give these subscribers a kind of um, good indication of their signature style. It's really good fun, actually. You would think that they would all come back exactly the same, and I can tell you from the next quarter, they are nothing like each other at all. It is brilliant. But this is the last quarter, it's the autumn one, and we did something a bit different in this, in that we asked each of the dyes to concentrate on a different area of the photo, and we used the same base for each dye, which we don't normally do. The reason for this was that uh, we wanted to give people a few more options when it came to uh, projects, and to be able to combine some of the colours together to make larger projects, to make striped projects, which are very popular, um, or even, in the case of one of the subscribers, make an entire jumper from one from one shipment, which I thought was amazing. And um, the yarns that we selected and the dyes that we selected were as follows. The first one was um, Sylvan Tiger Yarns, which is dyed by Katie in Yorkshire. And she uses um, natural methods to produce uh, her dyes. She uses all natural dyes to produce her yarns. It was dyed onto her Yan sock base, which is 100% blue face Leicester, and was dyed, as I said, using natural dyes, and she got the tree. So she decided to concentrate on how leaves are turning and changing colour at the end of autumn, and the kind of how they get a little sort of dusty colour, but they're still green, because it, obviously when the shipment went out, it was the end of autumn. So um, that was kind of a semi-solid dye and quite a bit of depth to the colours. It was interesting to see how natural dyes come out really because I'm a fan of, as you know, primary colours and the more saturated the better. So this wasn't exactly my cup of tea in terms of um, what I would choose as a colour choice because it wasn't a crayon colour <laughs> basically. <laughs> Um, but looking at it, it is a very kind of sophisticated colour and when she explained her inspiration and how she'd interpreted it, it made quite a bit more sense to me and obviously it matched the other colours a little bit better because they are also not crayon colours. Um, the second dye we got concentrated on the wheat in the picture and the picture will be in the show notes so you can have a look and that was Michelle Dupriest from Hartlem Yarns in South Africa from Rabia Castile in the Western Cape and she wanted to do the wheat because in the Western Cape and the landscape around where she lives there are a lot of wheat fields and she also included some of those pictures for us to have a look at as she's inspired by her surroundings when she's dying. So that was dyed onto the all days sock base and all of her sock bases are named after places in South Africa. All days is up in the northwest, not that far away from where mm -hmm. I used to live as you kind of go in towards the crossing to Botswana. 
So I have been to all days. There's not a lot there. And <laughs> certainly no yarn because it's very warm. And um, she decided to dye the wheat. I think this was my favourite out of the three. Um, which is surprising because that isn't normally a colour that I would go for. But I really liked the depth and the tones and the kind of real classy colours that she'd produced uh, when she dyed that yarn. And it is a very golden uh, colour. It is a perfect representation of the wheat, to be honest with you. And um, it's a slightly different spin to both that of the Sylvan Tiger and the next dyer. Um, who I think dyed onto the exact same base and um, it is dyed in South Africa but it was a British BFL base from Heartland so she does like to use mm. imported bases as well oh dear, it would seem Mumbles bored of the yarn chat already pipe down pipsqueak and finally the third yarn that we uh, commissioned was by Linda of Kettle Yarn Company down in London and she dyed this onto her twist base She's a big fan of blues and greens, so she she went for the uh, teal of the sky and actually ended up going more towards the kind of turquoise, really, shade. It's a semi-solid, and again, it's on her twist base, which is 100% Blue Face Lester. And it's, again, quite grown up. It's a semi-solid. It's quite, it's quite a lot of tonal colours in there, quite a not, lot of nice shading. Um, and I want to combine the Hartlem and the Kettle Yarn to do a stripe study shawl or at least I did until I saw Linda Rose's project where she combined all three to make a jumper and actually the green and the gold also looks really nice together kind of reminds me of South Africa as well so um, I, that's all up in the air now it might turn into a happy street or a colour affection instead but because it's all the same base uh, same uh, characteristics of the fibre um, and the spin is the same on two of the yarns. It should work out quite well and be quite balanced. So that was the offering from the August uh, Club, which was Autumn Harvest was the picture. And I'll put that in the show notes. I'll also put a little link in to um, TGS if you want to go over there and have a look. There are a couple of those left, although I'm not sure how many. Kate has them. I sent them all to her. Um, there are literally one or two so there are one or two of those available but sign ups are open for the next quarter which is a celebration and it's a lot of fireworks in Hong Kong it is a beautiful picture I'll also add that in the show notes there are still spaces again for that and I've had two of the yarns already if you follow me on Instagram you'll have seen I'm getting all quite excited the little gold envelopes have turned up my gold envelope shipment because we ship all the yarns in shiny gold envelopes and um, two of the yarns have arrived and the other yarn's sitting in Inverness at the moment. Um, so I'm very, very excited to see that and to start wrapping them all up and sending them out. Unfortunately, I'll only have an electric fire to do this in front of and not an open fire like I did in my old house. But, you know, I'll turn on the little uh, light and, uh, and pretend it's a real fire and wrap all these up for you all. So... I'm very excited about that, but if you want to go and check it out, the website for that is www.thegoldenskin.com and I will link to that in the show notes. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got a little preview for you on the show today and this has come courtesy of Sonia at Blacker Yarns and it is a preview of their new yarn that's just about to be released on the 14th of November and it is Blacker West Country Tweed. Now I picked up a ball of this at Yarndale um, along with Louise. What's up Womble? Did you not get to come to Yarndale? Honestly, talk about subversive. Along with Louise of Knit British, who has also just reviewed this and given you her, her kind of take on it, as someone who is very, very big into her British breeds and uh, likes to use the more unusual breeds to work with, um, in her latest episode, which I will link to in the show notes, so you can get her opinion on, uh, on it as well, if you like. But we went along and uh, had a mooch around the stall, had a good squish of the blacker, Swan and um, showed her my almost finished cardigan and picked up a ball of the uh, West Country Tweed. Now it comes in four shades and I have the DK to uh, review here and it comes in undyed which is a natural grey 
and grey and black which gives you an overall kind of heathered grey look and then there are three shades that are over dyed onto the undyed one one that is a kind of denim blue, one that is a heathery purple and one that is an olive green and they are called blue, purple, olive and undyed for the grey. I went for the undyed just to wine Claire Divine up because it was grey and I'm a bit into grey at the moment because it makes the shiny pretty crayon colours look more beautiful and uh, this is a blend actually of two different sheep and the thing that I liked about it and that attracted my interest into it because I only ever review things that I like and I'm interested in on the podcast um, was the provenance of this yarn and it comes from two only two farms within 100 miles of one another in uh, Devon and Cornwall and it's Devon and Somerset actually I think it is and then it's spun in Cornwall so everything happens in a very small area which I think is really good as you know I'm a big fan of the Blacker Swan because it all comes from one farm uh, at Swan Inlet on the Falkland Islands and again I like this I like a good story behind a yarn and I like that it's all come from a a local operation if you will it has uh, the British wool mark and as I said it is spun by Blacker in Cornwall so it also has the Made in Cornwall badge which I think is quite cool now this yarn is a DK weight, it's 100% pure new wool and as I mentioned it is limited edition West Country Tweed and it's made from a blend of Tees Water Crossbred Wool which comes from the Mendip Hills and Black Welsh Mountain Wool which comes from Devon. It is um, 11 wraps per inch and wool and spun and it gives you 110 metres per 50 gram ball which I believe is going to be retailing at £6 per ball standard kind of uh, tension uh, 10 by 10 20 stitches by 28 rows on four mils so it's you know it's right in the middle of that DK kind of band really now it's not merino is it it's some breeds that you probably won't have heard of before and I think it's quite important that we start trying some uh, some different ones to be honest with you the tease water as it, as it, they've mentioned themselves is quite a lustrous wool and they have quite long fleeces if you've seen pictures of them they look like almost like an afro sheep because they've got very very long fleeces and uh, the black Welsh, Welsh mountain is a black sheep entirely black and the wool is black it's been bred to be black but obviously as you get into the sun and the wool gets weathered it does become more of a brownie shade um, as it gets bleached by the sun because you get quite a lot of sun down in uh, Devon and Cornwall and uh, so do we up here actually but that's another story and um, yeah it's a blend of these two yarns um, the colours that they've chosen are to to link in with the landscapes around them really and so that you can kind of connect with, with how the things you know how things look down there people are quite often inspired by nature and, and blacker do tend to use this in a lot of their yarns and when they're choosing their colourways as they did with the um, the blacker swan and that's all based on different plants and the sea and the landscape in the Falkland Islands and this is this is no exception so it's it's three very heathery looking dyed shades and the grey which is undyed now also within this yarn it has some very very subtle neps and I mean super subtle I, as you know, have some weird things when it comes to yarn. Sorry, Womble. You're not enjoying this yarn, are you? I have some very strange things, like not liking garter stitch because it looks untidy. And I'm not an, a massive fan of neps in yarn, and particularly not quite big slub, slubby kind of neps. But I'm pleased to say the neps in this are really, really small and very subtle. And what I really like is there are little tiny, tiny flashes of colour throughout the grey. I can see some yellow, there's some little thin blue, blue. there's some green, there's some pink. And it's, I mean, I'm saying that in a very kind of basic pink, blue primary way. Um, but you have to kind of look at it quite hard. They are really tiny little flashes of colour, which I think just makes it have a little bit more personality. This, again, the little nets were, were kind of based on wildflowers that they see around 
um, the area where they work, which, you know, it makes sense. It all ties together. And I think that gives it a bit of added interest and would make it so that this, this yarn could be used for not just for your kind of really traditional projects, you could use it for kind of kiddie stuff as well and and get away with it really and have something a bit more kind of sophisticated but that will still kind of appeal and not be too rustic if that's what you're looking for. Now it is quite a sheepy feeling yarn and by that I mean it isn't super soft baby merino kind of loveliness in that way um, but it isn't really scratchy or anything it's just a little bit crisp and I'm not sure if you can I'll hold it up to the microphone and give it a little, a little crunch for you um, so which is good but I did swatch with it and it actually washes up quite quite soft it softens up and it blooms a little bit as you wash it I think because of the, the fleeces they've used to make this blend, it will be quite a hard wearing blend. And, you know, I love a lovely soft buttery merino as much as the next person does. Um, but clearly, you know, from, from my uh, Lush cardigan, it's all well and good saying that. But if you have two children that spend all day jumping on you, it's going to pill. It's going to pull quite quickly. This, I think, will be a little bit more hard wearing. It certainly feels like it will in the swatch. And I haven't kind of had a child jump up and down on me with this swatch pinned on or anything. Um, but what I am doing, I'm in the middle of knitting up a hat in it that um, I'm going to give to Millie to try and see how it wears, you know, against the elements and with a bit of abrasion and a bit of rubbing and see how we get on with that. And I'll report back on its performance um, in a few weeks when he's had a chance to wear it and tell me what he thinks and uh, we can see how well it stands up to um, general wear and tear. I think the pattern I will use, well, the, the pattern that I am using and I'm still quite happy with at the moment is the Hipster Hat by Tin Can Knits, which comes in Pacific Knits, the book. So I'm going to do that. It's a very simple kind of uh, stocking stitch hat um, and we'll see exactly how, how that stands up. As I mentioned, this yarn isn't available yet for general sale on the Blacker website, but it will be available from the 14th. However, what I would recommend you do, if you're interested in maybe trying out some different sheep breeds to see what kind of properties the the yarn gives you um, for different breeds, rather than just your standard Merino, BFL, um, that you head on over to Blacker. It's something they've been doing for a long time and I just don't think that maybe the message was getting out as much but since Sonia's been down there they definitely seem to be blowing the kind of British breed trumpet a little bit harder which I think can only be a good thing. And um, if there are any yarns or any fibres that you've been curious about that maybe you've wanted to try that you've heard spinners talking about you know if you fancy a bit of Wensleydale or Jacobs or anything like that they have a yarn in pretty much every breed that you can just, you know, get it, just get one ball, give it a little swatch, make a little hat out of it, see what you think. Most of them are in quite natural colours, but some of them are over dyed and expand your horizons really and try a few different things to, to give you the properties in, in a, a garment or an accessory that you're looking for. And Claire will come on to this, I think, in the next segment when she talks about choosing yarn for socks and it wasn't something that ever kind of really occurred to me to too great a deal because because I'm a lover of primary colours um, is to try different sheep breeze and to try different blends and it doesn't necessarily mean if you need a hard wearing yarn that you have to go for something with nylon there are kind of fleeces out there and there are spins out there that will give you those properties if you're prepared to look beyond you know the, the big players like merino and bfl although you know bfl is brilliant it is very hard wearing it's beautiful it's lustrous um but there are there are other alternatives out there and you know as as we get more into the yarn and more into really thinking about how to choose an appropriate yarn for the project that you're doing and to go further than aesthetic and start looking more into practicality of the yarns that you're using for different projects as you become more educated around that um you know there's there's a whole host of opportunities that are there and there are suppliers there that can can you know give you things that are quite accessible for you to start that sort of journey really so this would be a good place to start I think because it's probably something you've never knit with before 
um, two breeds you've never knit with before. Um, it's quite cheap, you know, six pounds a ball, that ball, that will do me, that'll get me a medium sized adult hat. For six quid, you can't get one in Tesco's for that. And um, and give it a try, see see what you think of, of using some different breed yarns. But that is uh, my review and a bit of preaching in general about um, about British breeds and, and where to go to find all those different kinds of yarns. So that is um, Blacker Yarns West Country Tweed and it is available from www.blackeryarns.co.uk priced at £6 from the 14th of November but head on over to the website, have a mooch around at their different breed yarns and with each listing there is quite a lot of information about the properties of that yarn and where it comes from and if you're into your provenance um, then that would be a good place to start because there's loads and loads of information about provenance on their website for each of their yarns. I'm very pleased to be welcoming in Claire Devine and Kate Reed for our first uh, session on all things socky that I mentioned we were going to be starting uh, the episode before last because you got a special little quick uh, Halloween episode as I was feeling so inspired uh, by the pattern pick last week so I am thrilled to be introducing them on today. Before Christmas we're going to be looking at uh, preparing to learn to knit socks and different things to give some consideration to um, before you even start really and in this episode we're going to be focusing on how to choose yarn for socks. Kate will also be there to help us because she's a new sock knitter, she's just started knitting socks um, and there are a baffling array of options out there and if you've just come into it and you're kind of brand new and a little bit wet behind the ears you're just not going to necessarily know all of the options available to you so before Christmas we're going to be concentrating on on the basics of you know how to choose a yarn and and what you need to consider and that'll be in this episode and then after Christmas there's going to be a big sort of year-long knit fest essentially sock fest on uh, how to knit socks and loads of different techniques loads of different um methods heels toes yarns patterns you name it it's all going to be kind of going on on uh, little bits on the podcast and on the blog and on claire's blog as well so that by the end of the year you know if you're um if you're looking to start knitting socks it's a brilliant introduction you'll have your hand held throughout the year and um, if you're already a reasonably um, accomplished sock knitter, there'll also be options available to you um, using the same techniques that we're talking over. You might pick up a few tips and you can do a slightly more difficult pattern um, and still get some of the benefit out of it, really. Um, I think it's a great idea. I'm a big fan of uh, educating people and uh, trying new things with knitting. And although a lot of this information is out there, at the moment it's just it's all over the place and you never know where to go to get something and we're trying to kind of build something where you can come and you can find everything you want to find about socks in one place so and obviously going along with that there is going to be a little bit of comedy there will still be quite a bit of messing about on the on the podcast there will still be pattern picks and everything else there will still be interviews because they've been very very popular and i know you enjoy those um but i think this is just a way of um of bringing everyone together under a, a kind of socky blanket really so I will pass on to myself Kate and Claire in the past where we uh, discussed and giggled a little bit about uh, choosing yarn for socks um okay so this is the introduction of our new segment on the podcast i have been joined by the equally lovely claire divine of yarn and pointy sticks designs and kate my northern friend kate who is in no way tight (laughs) but she is from yorkshire (laughs) welcome to the show ladies hello hello so i think we're going to start at the top of of sock knitting and the the beginning of, of kate's journey into socks which was unwind Brighton and mincing around all the shops, particularly Sparkle Duck, uh, <laughs> to find some yarn to knit her ungrateful boyfriend some socks. <laughs> but um, it's not always easy to figure out what 
is the best uh, materials to use for your socks because not every uh, four ply or sock weight yarn is created equal and I'm pretty sure that Claire is going to give us some tips on that. So I will hand over to Kate who's going to uh, give us some questions for Claire. Uh, hi Claire. Hi so Kate. I'm just starting out with knitting socks and really before I even cast on I want to think about how do I pick the right yarn. So like Joe said, at Unwind, I was basically just going around and looking at the labels, looking for something that said sock wool and then picking a colour I liked. Is that the best place to start or do I need to think about other things? Um, I suppose it's sort of the best place to start because I do think the most important thing is knitting with something that you love. Um, I always advocate to sort of get yarn that you really want to work with as opposed to yarn that you think might be the best thing um, because at the end of the day you're going to be knitting with it for a while um, and if you're knitting with something you don't like that's not going to be great. But I do think there are some very important things to consider when choosing yarn for any project and um, I often divide things into three categories when I talk um, about knitting in general but also more specifically about socks. And they are very relevant to yarn um, choices. And the three are fit, durability, and aesthetic. Um, so I suppose starting at the top, and this is just my personal preference. Knitting is all about personal preferences. So um, some people may have differing views. But I think fit with socks is absolutely crucial. If your socks don't fit, if they're baggy around your ankles, or goodness gracious, baggy around the toes inside your shoes, um, they're not going to be pleasant to wear. So when you're looking at yarn, you need to think about how your yarn choice is going to affect the fit of your socks. Now, it's not the key thing for fit. That's more about sort of measuring and gauge. And we'll talk about that later. But here we're talking about fiber content. And I think this is relevant because probably walking around unwind, you will have seen lots of things that were sock yarn or four ply. Um, especially if you were looking at things like Sparkle Duck, which were beautiful silk blends, and I'm sure the colours were amazing, um, but they're not going to work for socks. So I suppose in summary, you want to avoid things that have a lot of drape, um, silk, bamboo, and cotton are not your friends when it comes to knitting socks. Maybe a little touch with some luxury, but if you start looking at something with 25% silk or 50% silk, you're going to have really drapey socks. And as I'm sure you can imagine, um, drapey socks aren't really what you're aiming for. So I don't know if that, did you see anything that sort of would have fit that bill when you were at Unwind? I did something that was really nice pink and with some kind of blues into it as well. It was so soft and nice. And actually, I bought something like that, but I can't remember how much silk it had in it. But um, I can't remember if it was actually described as sock wool or if it was just a four ply. Maybe that's not the best one to use for me then. Maybe not. Um, and again, it, this sort of links in with durability. I think if you're having a pair of luxurious socks, um, a little bit of silk is nice. Um, it does allow the colours to pop and it will give you sort of a really soft and luxurious um, yarn, but I wouldn't go anything over 15% silk okay. if you are going to opt for something with silk. And then you need to be very careful what kind of pattern you choose and um, things like your gauge and stuff. And we can talk about that later. Um, but those are, are even more important if you're picking something with silk because it's a little harder to work with. That sort of lends us, leads us on sorry, to durability. Um, and as with the fact you need your socks to fit, you also want your socks to last. Now, um, here certainly all yarns are not created equal. And I know that often people want soft wool and they don't like scratchy wool and um, they pick up gorgeous skeins of um, really sort of soft merino. But I suppose I have to say socks usually go inside shoes and, um, you know, shoes get warm and sometimes, unfortunately, a little damp. And um, heat and moisture and friction from walking um, usually equals some degree of felting. So if you pick a really soft, beautiful 100% um, merino, the chances that your socks are going to felt is very high. So what you need to think about when looking at durability is, again, the fibre content. And there you're looking for something with nylon. 
Now, I know that people might be recoiling in horror at the idea of this unnatural fibre where we all want beautiful natural wools, but a little bit of nylon goes a long way in your sock yarn choice. And there you can look at anything from 10 to 25% nylon, and that will really help your socks to wear and last much longer um, than something without nylon. Um, again, also in terms of durability, you want to look at things like how the yarn has been spun. So I don't know if you noticed sort of the, the way the yarn had been created, whether it was quite tight or quite loose or quite lofty. Did you, did you see anything like that at Unwind? Um, I'm not sure. I have some yarn in front of me to look at while mm -hmm. you're talking, just to think about. And I've found my silk one. It, it does say sock on the label, but it's 50% merino, 50% silk. Whereas another one from the same company that I got in a different colour scheme is 70% merino, 20% nylon, 5% stellina. And the silk one looks kind of less wound than the other one. Absolutely. I think it's something that um, it sort of annoys me a little bit when people call things sock yarn, because I think it is misleading for many people. Um, I suppose it should more be four ply, but I suppose sock is, is seen as a weight as well. I'd keep the silk for a shawl mm -hmm. or for something beautiful in terms of an accessory that's not going to be in your shoes. Um, and I think it's important that you noted that the, the silk seems sort of a little less tight on the spin. Yeah. Um, and that would, again, really affect the durability. So even if you didn't have these drapey socks, um, because of the friction um, and the sort of looser spin, they won't wear as well. So what you're looking for, and that one with Stellina is um, perfect for socks. It's got your wool, it's got your, your natural fiber content, it's got your nylon, and then it's got a little bit of sparkle. Because at the end of the day, we do want things to look <laughs> pretty. You know, we exactly. don't want... We haven't always got shoes on. Exactly. And, um, and we want something nice to create something nice. If we just wanted utilitarian grey socks, we could just go and buy utilitarian grey socks at the shop, I suppose. Um, so that leads me on to aesthetic. And there, there are so many choices. And I suppose the whole idea of the three categories is that it's about weighing things up. So what is most important to you? Are you creating some heavy boot socks where durability is key? fit is second and who actually cares what they look like because they're going to be inside your walking boots um or are you creating a beautiful pair of socks with an intricate pattern that you're going to wear occasionally with open back shoes so that they fit you is very important that they look beautiful is absolutely key and that they wear very well well you know that's not the most important factor so when you start to look at it like that you start to sort of see how the three areas um, interplay together and then you just need to make decisions based on what's most important and what can um, sort of fit that bill um, most effectively and I've got lots of more got lots more information that's going to go on the blog about how you might make choices but I'm um, just talking about aesthetic here you're looking at things like the color of the yarn the way it's been dyed um, the texture or the fiber content um, and that has many different bearings. So just some examples, and there'll be loads more examples on the blog. But um, if you've got cables or a textured detail, if you pick a really dark sock yarn, you're not going to see them as well as if you pick something slightly lighter. So if you're going to put lots of effort into making a beautifully cabled sock, you probably want people to see those cables. So pick a slightly lighter shade. And um, conversely, I know some people like really brightly colored yarns. I know Joe has some very sort of bright primary colors, lots and lots of colors in the skein. And they're fantastic. And there's nothing wrong with using them for socks, but maybe don't use them for something that's got an intricate lace pattern because you're not going to see it. Um, if you want something like that, pick a pattern with slip stitches that's going to sort of really allow those colors mm. to play together on the sock and um, work so working with the yarn and the pattern, you can then start to pull things together. Um, another thing is self-patterning and self-striping yarns. I know they're, they're very big and um, they're, they're wonderful. Um, a pair of plain vanilla socks, you can really jazz them up with some self-stripe. Um, something that we'll talk about later in the series is how your choice of heel will impact how the stripes 
are, are represented on your sock. So there are different things to think about. Um, but I think the key thing to take away with yarn is the fiber content and how that's going to fit, affect the fit and the durability of your socks. So you want natural fibers, not too much silk or cotton or bamboo, um, and something that's going to give you durability. So a tight spin and some nylon. I have my third skein. Can I ask you a quick question? Of course about you this? can. This one is 100% superwash blue face Leicester. Now this mm -hmm. one appears to have a tighter twist than mm -hmm. the other two, but it's really bright colors. And that's what I liked about it as well. And I remember saying to the man, but what's it going to look like when I knit it? So this one doesn't have any nylon and it doesn't describe itself as sock, but I was told that it would be good for socks. It would. And Blueface Leicester is one of those um, breeds that works very well for socks um, because it still has the softness, but it is a lot more durable um, than something like a Merino. And I certainly am not an expert on microns and types of fleeces, etc., um, but 100% Blue Face Leicester will be much better for socks than 100% Merino. Now, in terms of the durability stakes, if you added some nylon into that, it would be even so more even durable. I see. Um, but 100% Blue Face Leicester in my book is fine for a pair of socks that you don't expect to be the, the most hard wearing socks in the world. Cool. Um, and the fact that you've got really bright colors there is, is, is an added bonus. And that's where you start to weigh up, you know, does it, what does it look like? Is that more important than how, how it will wear, vice versa? And if you want to know how it's going to knit up, knit a little swatch. <laughs> often what I say to people is because a variegated skein will look completely different knitted up than what it will do yeah. in, in the skein. Um, so, or, or go on to Ravelry because I know that the word swatch um, makes a lot of people recoil in horror and they look at me as if to say I really have better things to do than swatch so pop onto Ravelry um, and have a look at what other people have knitted because then you can start to see uh, see if um, I can see mine in there or something exactly. very similar yeah and um, especially with some of the bigger the bigger dyers um, they sell enough yarn that people will have knitted projects with those colorways and then you can look about a look at things like how um, short or long the color repeats are and if there's any pooling so that's when the one sort of color fits together in a pool around the sock and then you need to think about the pattern you choose and how that's going to link to that that's a really good idea So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, knitters, crocheters and all of you who love a comedy toilet roll holder, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this episode. Thank you very much for joining me. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here with all three of us and Womble, the slightly subversive Sheltie. If you want any explanation or any further information about anything we covered in the uh, sock segment, then please do just forward that through on email and I'll send it through to Claire. And we'll try and address some of your uh, questions as they come up in future episodes of the podcast. If you've enjoyed the podcast particularly today, um, I'd be very, very grateful if you consider leaving me an iTunes review and that just helps other people find the podcast and joining the fun, really. I hope you all have a super week. Thank you for joining me and happy crafting. Speak to you all again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Shiny Bees podcast. Show notes to this episode can be found on the blog at www.shinybees.com. I'm Shiny Bees on Ravelry, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest and Facebook, so feel free to give me a shout. Or you can email me at shinybeesinfo at gmail.com. Music for this episode is provided courtesy of Music Alley and is by Adam and the Walter Boys. It's I Need a Drink. <laughs>